I'm Laura Nelson, President and CEO of the National Cryptologic Foundation. Welcome to the first of our year-long 25th anniversary celebration events. For those of you who may not know a lot about the foundation, we were initially created to support the National Cryptologic Museum by acquiring artifacts, exhibits, testimonies, etc. Over the years, the foundation's mission has changed. Today, we continue to support the museum and much more. We have a cyber education program that is rapidly expanding. To celebrate our anniversary, we are very excited to welcome six former NSA directors, many of whom I've had the opportunity to work with and a pleasure to serve under during my own 37 year career at the agency. Unfortunately, General Hayden had a previous engagement and is unable to join us today. We hope to feature him in a, for a future event. Thank you directors for joining us today. We're thrilled to have you, albeit virtually, to help us kick off what I know will be an exciting year of celebratory events. We'd like to thank our supporting sponsors. First, our title sponsors, Dell Technologies and Fed Data, as well as Paraton, Accenture, Mantech, and AT&T. It is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Bull of Dell Technologies. Jeff is the Dell Technologies Federal Account Manager for NSA. Prior to working in industry, Jeff served as a Navy SEAL for 20 years, culminating his career as the officer in charge of the Cold Weather Maritime and Mountaineering Training Center at Basic Training Command. He served at the National Mission Unit and led global special activities in his capacity as an intelligence officer. He additionally served on SEAL teams four and 10. Over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Laura. And thank you to the National Cryptologic Foundation for orchestrating this event. On behalf of Dell Technologies, it's my honor to introduce six NSA directors with combined service of over 205 years. Gentlemen, thank you for your sacrifices and everything you've done and continue to do for our country. First, I'd like to introduce Admiral Bobby Inman, the ninth director of the NSA. He served as the director of Naval Intelligence, the vice director of the DIA, the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency, and currently is the managing director of Limestone Capital Advisors, investing in startup technology companies. Next, I'd like to introduce Admiral Bill Studeman, the 12th director of the NSA. He served as a former deputy director of the CIA and two extended periods as acting director of the CIA. He's a former member of the National Cryptologic Foundation's Board of Directors. Vice Admiral J. Mike McConnell is the 13th director of the NSA and the second director of national intelligence from 2007 to 2009. He served as the vice chairman of Booz Allen Hamilton and currently leads the Cyber Florida and is on the NCF's board of directors. Lieutenant General Kenneth Minahan, the 14th director of the NSA, served as the director of the DIA. And during his tenure at the NSA, created the vision for the National Cryptologic Muse Museum and Foundation. He served as the chairman of, for the founders group of the Capital Campaign for Cyber Center and Education Innovation and is a member of the NCF's Board of Directors, currently Managing Director of Paladin. General Keith Alexander, the 16th Director of the NSA, has a distinction of serving longer in the role than any other director. He is first appointed director or commander of US Cyber Command and is a founder of the NCF's Campaign for Cyber Center Education and Innovation and is currently the President and CEO of IronNet Cybersecurity. And finally, Admiral Michael Rogers, our 17th director of the NSA. He's the second commander of US Cyber Command, also served as the commander of Fleet Cyber Command, the commander of 10th Fleet, the director of intelligence for the chairman of Joint Chiefs. And he is currently serving on several corporate boards, advisory boards, and is an adjunct professor at Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Laura, over to you, Jeff. Thank you. Our moderator for today's program is the National Security Correspondent for National Public Radio, Greg Myrie. 
Greg's focus is the intelligence community, a position that follows his many years as a foreign correspondent covering conflicts around the globe. Thank you and turn it over to Greg. Thank you, Laura. Uh, real pleasure to be here. What an extraordinary uh, group we have here. Uh, more than 200 years of experience as, as we heard, but more than a quarter century of experience as directors of the National Security Agency. So uh, we're gonna dive right in and I really wanna hear some stories about your time as director. And Admiral Inman, I'd like to start with you. You were a director under President Carter. Um, and of course, a big, uh, in that final year, you had the Americans being held hostage in Iran. And that played out right up until the final day of his presidency. And you were deeply involved in it. Can you, can you tell us what it was like literally on that, that final day? I had worked closely with President Carter from October through till January the 20th. He kindly called about 10 o'clock in the morning on the 20th to tell me he'd awarded me the National Security Medal and ask what the current status was and told him we were still tracking. I called him when he was in the limo with the president-elect headed to the Capitol to tell him that the hostages were in the aircraft at the end of the runway in Tehran, but would not be permitted to take off till he was no longer president. He thanked me and asked me to leave word at Andrews. So when he went there from the Capitol to fly back to planes, to notice that they were out safely. Once they were clear of Iranian airspace, I called the VIP office at Andrews and it was answered by former Secretary of State Cy Vance, who had resigned as secretary over the hostage rescue effort. But he had gone to Andrews to pay his respects to President Carter on his departure. Wow, wow, amazing, amazing story. Um, I want to, to follow up, I neglected to mention before I, before I ask you, um, you just had a very big milestone, your 90th birthday last week. So I think we should all uh, uh, virtually give a round of applause to uh, Admiral Inman on, on that milestone. Um, Admiral Studeman, um, you know, anybody who's been inside the NSA, and I get invited there very occasionally, but not too often, uh, notices the uh, dress code there is, is a little unique. Um, you know, you see uh, lots of uh, people in their military uniforms looking sharp, and you see a lot of guys uh, not so sharp. Um, you got a story to tell us about uh, dress code issues you've, uh, you've seen in your day at NSA. Right. Uh, so you asked me about a funny story rather than a professional story. <clears throat> so I think uh, back on an event that occurred in the Friedman Auditorium when I was giving out some awards for high performance and uh, in the SIGIN business, and amongst them were a batch of cryptologists. And as they were called to come on stage to receive their award, I noticed that one of the awardees was wearing no shoes. And so uh, we ended up giving the award to this man. He had forgotten to wear his shoes that day to work. He was a very distinguished uh, crypto mathematician. And as he left the stage, he was given a big round of applause uh, by the people in the audience. <laughs> okay, yes, that, that, that wouldn't surprise me having, having seen a little bit out there. Um, Admiral McConnell, you came into office in, in 1992. Um, the Cold War has just ended. Everybody's talking about the peace dividend, and there's going to be some big changes going on. And you, you mentioned that you, there was an initial meeting in, in terms of what changes might be taking place there, and there were a few surprises. Could you, could you tell us about those? Well, thanks for the, for the question, uh, Greg, but I want to start by noting the longest serving director as uh, director of National Security Agency. It's an army guy and it just takes army guys a little longer to get it right. So I just want to note that as we go, go through our discussion, but uh, all right, peace dividend. We want the money back. Uh, Cold War's over. Uh, and the other thing that was happening is the internet was just about to explode. So this is a challenging time for NSA budget uncertainty, 
um, the emphasis on not focusing on the Soviet Union, which was gone away. And we were a global organization, uh, literally from the Arctic to the Indian Ocean, uh, the Pacific to the Atlantic to Europe to surround the old Soviet Union. And so the thinking was to dismantle that. So I'm really focused on the signals intelligence side of NSA's mission. I always break it down to uh, uh, two phrases, break code, that's the signals intelligence side, uh, make code, that's the protect side. And so I knew nothing about the protect side. You know, I'd been in the fleet where you change key cards and you, you went through a normal procedure, but the world was changing dramatically from secret key, key cards would use for um, 100 years, to public key and software and networking and software encryption. So I'm, I'm really starting to focus on this, trying to understand it. Uh, so a, a senior from the make code side came into my office and said, well, welcome, Mr. Director. We're glad you're here. What do you know about, he called it InfoSec. Today we call it cybersecurity. What do you know about InfoSec? And I said, well, I know you got to scramble the message so it's confidential. And he said, uh, you don't know very much about InfoSec. Do you? <laughs> so that started our, our conversation. Uh, he gave me the five fundamentals of information security that I have never forgotten. They served me well throughout the rest of my career. But what he, the statement he made was quite a shock. Mr. Director, you're responsible for the integrity of the nuclear command and control system. And I, I said, I'm what? And we started to focus on that and get involved in it. And because the internet explosion and because the whole country was racing to embrace this new information technology, and because we were changing the way we did SIGINT and it was so easy, the reverse is, oh my goodness, we're more vulnerable than any other nation. And that, ex that was beginning to exist then. It still exists today, solar winds, um, the Hafnium, the Chinese exploitation of the Microsoft Exchange um, uh, activities uh, some weeks ago. So uh, it, it caused me to focus on something I've worried about from that initial discussion, and I still worry about it today. We have a long way to go. So uh, for a new guy, I, I came to be the, the king of SIG SIGINT, and I, I walked away with my tail between my legs worrying about it the make code side as opposed to the break code side. You, you raised several points we're going we're gonna to follow up on a little later in our discussion, but I'd like to go to you, uh, General Minahan. You have a story very relevant to the Cryptologic uh, Museum, um, talking about a ceremony that you held there in, in 1999, and it, uh, even just the ceremony in the museum had its own uh, elements of drama. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. It was, uh, it was clear to me that as we went along, you heard people refer to the NSA Museum, not the NSA CSS Museum. So it was pretty clear we were missing a, a whole half of our team in the way we recognized what was occurring there. So we decided to build the air park and we would put a C-130 in the air park as the first aircraft there. And the C-130 would be tail numbered. Uh, to recognize the C-130 that the Soviet shot down in 1959. We went through all of that and we I said, let's give the families who, didn't, who knew nothing a briefing on what occurred, give the airmen who were, who were killed in the aircraft air medals, which had never occurred before, and have a ceremony where everybody was recognized as part of that. So that was all scheduled, we're all set. We have the families in place. It's the day before we're having a reception. My general counsel comes up and he says, sir, you have to cancel everything. I said, well, why would I do that? He said, we've never admitted that NSA does SIG in from aircraft. I said, well, no kidding. He said, you know what? I'm going to admit it tomorrow and I'm going to be the second guy. You're going to do it today. And, and this is like three in the afternoon. I said, good luck with the Washington Post. So if you go and look on the day before the ceremony, the Post has two sentences in there written by the general counsel which said the National Security Agency acknowledges that it does SIG in from aircraft. And that, that's how that got, got taken care of. The sidelight of all that, in an air guy, um, I said, you know what? I'm gonna have a missing man formation for this C-130. 
And it's going to be C-130s, and Chris Inglis is going to fly lead and bring his wing down and do it. So if you go and look, the work first and only C-130 missing man is flown by Chris Inglis at lead, and, uh, and it's a free ship, and it, and it was one slide open for the aircraft that was shot down. And to this day, uh, everybody is in, is in awe and respect for what Chris did. Wow, um, we're going to talk about Chris Inglis a little a little later as well, and I and I really like that precedent you set of calling the press when you have something to say. So uh, I I encourage all of you to do that. If you got something you want to share, uh, just give me a call anytime. I'm 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 all ears. Um, General Alexander, um, you came into office in 2005 kind of a busy time, uh, two big wars going on. And, and a year into your uh, tenure there, President George W. Bush comes over for a visit to the NSA. Could you tell us how that went? Yeah, it was interesting because uh, Admiral Inman talked about uh, dealing with presidents. So one of the things that I was not used to in the Army is talking to the president, going down to the White House, going into the uh, sit room and sitting down and talking to the principals and deputy committee. Um, we had done that. President Bush came out to NSA for a visit. I think Admiral McConnell will remember this because he was there. And I asked the Secret Service guy, so he's gonna come on this helicopter. Do I get in his car or do I get in my car? And, and the Secret Service guy goes, look, General, it's real easy. If he tells you to get in his car, get in his car. If he doesn't, get in your car. So okay, I, I can track that. So the helicopter lands, I salute, say, welcome to Fort Meade, Mr. President. He goes, get in the car. And he walked really fast. It's like, zoom. And he was, so I, I ran and uh, get in the car. He sat in the jump seat. I sat in his seat. Now there was no photographer. I thought, darn, can we get a picture of this, of, of me sitting in his seat? And so we take off. It's just the two of us. And he goes, General, I got two issues for you. First, they tell me you got too many bosses. And I thought, oh, my goodness, what are you going to do? Who are you going to throw under the bus? There was Cambone, Rumsfeld, you know, think of uh, Stratcom. We had all these different bosses. And who do you throw under the bus? They're all senior to you and live the next day. So I looked the president right in the eye and I said, Mr. President, they're all good and nobody really bothers me. Admiral McConnell was one of those bosses as the DNI. So I didn't want to throw him under the bus. Well, maybe I should have, but I didn't. And <clears throat> he goes, General. There's another issue. This terror surveillance program is going to get really bad. It's going to be really bad. Here's the deal. You defend the country, I'll take the heat. And he did. It was the greatest act of leadership I've seen from anyone in service or in government. He went with Admiral McConnell and I and stood in front of Vice President Cheney, uh, Admiral McConnell, uh, Hadley, and myself and told the American people it was his program to defend the nation, and he took the heat. And it was, uh, it was absolutely amazing. And he, he would come out to NSA every year thereafter and uh, talk to the people about what they were doing to protect the country. So it was great. And it was he had a great and wicked sense of humor. So it was an honor and privilege to serve with him. And that's a very impressive uh, impersonation there. I'm tempted to ask all of you to impersonate the president you served under. Uh, Admiral Rogers, you want to take me up on that? <laughs> no, thank you. Well, I have two options there, but no thanks. Okay, okay. You know, Admiral Rogers, you left the director's chair just three years ago, and so much has been happening. Um, it, it feels like in your time there, there was just this explosion, this proliferation of threats that we saw in the cyberspace from obviously the traditional big state actors, the Russia and the China, but smaller state actors, non-state actors, criminal groups. I mean, did you have sort of any aha moment or, or you know, just did you feel like this tsunami was washing over you and the agency uh, during, during your time there? No, to, to Admiral McConnell's comment, look, I thought it was a logical extension of the mission that we had been ongoing with for decades already. Um, but you know, you had to keep in line with my teammates here, uh, two quick vignettes I thought that were one humorous and one that I thought really was one of the marked, you know, the value of NSA. The first is the humorous one. Hey, lots of people have presidents come to see them. You know, we had presidents come out during my time. But the one I remember the most in many ways was James Bond. 
So Daniel Craig reaches out and says he'd like to come out to NSA and just meet the men and women do it, doing the work. He's getting ready to start filming No Time to Die, which hopefully will ultimately be released this fall. Um, and I, I didn't want to in any way uh, hang around with him in the sense that I said, look, the, what we want you to do is talk to the men and women of the organization. And you don't need the director hanging around you to do that. So he was great. Walked all over uh, you know, the Blue Cubes spent time in the cafeteria, and then he came up to my office for a kind of out brief, and then he was gonna leave and go home. And, and the reason I highlight this, it just goes to show you as incredibly motivated, as hardworking as these men and women are at the National Security Agency, they're still men and women. So as I'm waiting for 007 to come into my office, I walk out to meet him, and the hallway is filled with people. And most of the people are women. I, I meet Daniel Craig, I walk him back into my office and sitting in my office is my aide who happens to, to be a woman in a dress uniform. I kind of thought for a minute and said, what are you doing? And she just said two words to me, James Bond, sir, James Bond. I said, okay, I got it, we're all human. Um, and then lastly, the, the thing that I thought, you know, I felt really good for the men with an NSA President Obama liked to do regular counterterrorism counter updates for the fight against ISIS. So it was the, all the national security team in the sit room. So him, the vice president, the national security advisor, chief of staff, you know, the attorney general, secretary of defense, the chairman, the DNI, FBI director, CIA director, myself. And at the end of one session, he kind of says, now I'm going to pose a rhetorical question and I don't expect an answer but I just want you all to think about this. And so we're all kind of wondering, I think, well, what is he gonna ask? And he says, could you explain to me why probably 85% of everything this nation does in the counterterrorism fight is coming from one organization? And he turned to me and said, Mike and NSA. And I just thought, wow. <laughs> I have to admit, on a humorous note, I'm, I'm sitting next to John Brennan, my CIA teammate, and I'm wondering if the human guy is going to choke. But uh, in any event, I just thought, you know, it's just great to see leadership, as has happened to all my predecessors, leadership recognizing the value of the work and the difference that the men and women of NSA make. I, I, I just love that. So, so let me, uh, I, I want to pick up on that and, and get into, I, I can't think of any organization that has, is changing and evolving as quickly as, as the NSA because the technology um, is, is changing so quickly. So Admiral Inman, take us back to the late 1970s, discuss the technology. We talk about terabytes and, and, and the language that we use today. Back then, it, it sounded like you you measured your computer space in real estate terms. Could you could you tell us what the computer setup was like back in the 1970s? We had 13 acres of computer <laughs> in that time frame to deal with the challenges that we had. Um, things that we remember from our time. I turned over uh, the directorship to General Farr on the 30th of March of uh, 81. Why that's so critical, we'd gone down to pay call on Secretary of Defense Weinberger, my farewell, links welcome. While we were there, word came that President Reagan had been shot. Uh, Weinberger's car and his driver were off doing errands for Mrs. Weinberger. So in our small NSA car, we took him to the White House for the meeting and sped on back to NSA, where your first concern when somebody shot at the president, is this part of a foreign plot or the rest of it? At that point, we didn't know that it was an insane American who had done the shot. But the point is, anytime something happens to the country, the first thing NSA does is to look, is this part of a larger threat anywhere else in the world? Mm -hmm. um, I would like to address this question to Admiral Studeman, but, but all of you should feel free to jump in after, after he responds. Um, when you were there in 1990, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. 
Um, the U.S. had not fought a war uh, since Vietnam, a major war since then. The U.S. had not fought a war in the Middle East in the modern era. Could you talk about um, that that event? And then I'd, I'd like to hear from others of you as, as we look at the U.S. has been involved in Middle East conflicts for um, 30 years. In fact, we you know had President Biden just, just yesterday announced the troop withdrawal in Afghanistan. But talk what it talk about what it was like at that moment, and then um, the the conflicts that all of you in, in various ways have had to 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 manage and be involved in since then. Sure. Well, the 1990-1991 time frame is obviously a very pivotal period of time. I'm there from 88 to 92, so I cover this period of the first Gulf War, uh, Desert Shield, which is the period of time running up to the Desert Storm active phase part of the war. And of course, uh, the, the, uh, the SIGINT uh, is very important to the prosecution of the war. And uh, we made some optimizations with regard to um, getting ready for Desert Storm. Recall also, by the way, 1991 is the end of the Cold War. So there's a lot going on in this period of time, pivotal period of time. In order to do the optimizations for readiness for going to war, did a lot of work with uh, Admiral McConnell, who was then the J-2. We stood up uh, and I actually sent my executive assistant, uh, the captain, cryptologic officer down to stand up a, a joint intelligence center in the basement of the Pentagon, which I think is the last time a JIC has been stood up there to get ready for support to the war. Uh, doing everything from doing maps to targeting support to getting all the flow ready for the information, the, uh, the, the crypt, all the cryptologic part, as Admiral Connell talked about, the code making for not only ourselves, but for interoperability for the allies. Uh, and uh, we had to build special centers inside NSA to, to optimize all the flow for support for this war giving all the forces that were flowing into the theater. So at that point in time, obviously, cryptology and high-performance computing, uh, the code breaking part was uh, very important. Uh, the code making part was very important as we were getting ready. Fortunately, we had this run-up period, which was uh, very critical. I think that the Joint Intelligence Center, which was down supporting uh, the Secretary that's Cheney and Colin Powell in the prosecution of the war was critical. We also tried to reach into the services to make sure that we had the connection points to allow SIGINT to flow as far into the combatant forces, including the allies, as we possibly could. So that was the core part. Uh, I will say that NSA is at war every day, but when you have actually a focused war like that, there are optimizations that have to be made. And I think that uh, we took the full six months even up to the day the war started. This is also the first uh, major informational warfare uh, crisis where we uh, actually, uh, obviously even uh, obvious to the media, we were attacking the command and control systems of the adversary. So uh, this is the beginning of the informational warfare, information operations influence, sort of forms of strategic communications as executed uh, across a broad spectrum in the context of that war. Mm -hmm. um, Can I uh, connect a couple of dots just as a matter of interest? Please. Um, working with uh, Admiral Studeman and he uh, turned the system on, uh, he also authorized us to take sensitive information and, and reduce it to a lower classification so we could make operational use of it. Um, the, the Navy's had long used something called a broadcast. Uh, we get information, we put it on broadcast, goes to all the ships at sea. So our idea was uh, not only will we have this incredibly valuable information, we'll broadcast it out there. Now, the, the dots I'm connecting are from Studeman to McConnell to Alexander, because what we learned late in the process is Army guys don't know what a broadcast is. So we're putting gold and jewels out there. And there was one lieutenant colonel who was a J-2, I think, for General Griffith and uh, one of the division commanders. You remember the description of frontal assault or end around? Uh, that, that was described by General Powell. Well, the end around force was, uh, uh, G, the G2 was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Keith Alexander. And he knew more about what was going on in the, in the battle area than some of the senior commanders. 
But later on, when, it, when I got to be the director of NSA, I want to go back and revisit with all those Army guys, uh, the, the, the people where they have corps commanders and so on. I could never get uh, General Schwarzkopf to, to uh, open up to a discussion, but I talked to General Franks, and he could not believe what I told him, what we had and how it was available. So uh, one, I was struck at um, how we could support, but how it wasn't uh, understood and received. And I'm going to set up my good friend, Keith Alexander, for what he did when he became the director later in the, in the next Gulf War, because he changed the whole tactical battle scene of how troops were supported. But I'm going to interject before Keith gets a chance to, simply to note from the outside, it was also during that period that Michael McConnell became a television star, appearing with great frequency. And the confidence that that built propelled him to go from one star to three to be Bill Studeman's successor as the director of NSA. General Alexander, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, well, first, uh, there was a lot of intel, and, and it was interesting. We did have the broadcast capability on one of our bands. We just took up a satellite feed, which would later get me in trouble when I was at Augsburg, but Admiral McConnell would bail me out on that. But what he brought up was the uh, operations in Iraq in 2006. Uh, if you recall, uh, we were taking increased casualties. I had just uh, uh, became director I was over in Iraq and looking at the intel that we had. Most of the Brigade 2s had in their desk drawer, they'd open up their desk drawer, were compact disks of all the threat adversaries that they knew. So they had all this in a disk. And they would get information from NSA, but it would take NSA time to take that, translate it, and get it back, 16 hours, roughly. So we went over and looked at, well, why does it take so long? What are we doing? And the results were, they want to make sure that the message is exactly right. And what the combat teams needed, they didn't care about how right it was. They wanted it fast and real time. So uh, we put together a system called the Real-Time Regional Gateway. And it's interesting because one of the people that was in Iraq at that time was Jen Easterly, who has just been nominated to be the CISA director. And Jen was in Iraq and we, we worked through the system that went from 16 hours down to one minute. We wanted Stan McChrystal to share his information. He was JSOC. He said, I can't, it's too sensitive. I said, Stan, we give you most of that information. You just enrich it. Why don't you give it back and we'll help you. And we were going back and forth. And I said, well, tell us the 10 guys you're trying to track. Uh, he said 10 guys. And as he was doing that, Jen entered that into the system. And when he was done talking, she turned it around and said, here's where five of them are located right now. Would that help you? And that changed the whole thing. That next, that over that next year, they helped take down 3,950 bad guys. So, you know, I think it's what uh, Admiral uh, Inman, McConnell, Studeman, and others built was the ability to make that uh, ready for combat use and to save our troops uh, across the board. And as you can see, it went on uh, for that time. So, great opportunity. Great. Greg, to put it in context, sure. uh, at the chairman's request, we provided from NSA direct support to the chairman and to General um, Guadacchini, who was running the operation at the time of the effort for the hostage rescue. Uh, the services were very reluctant to see us at that level. We were a national agency. We weren't supposed to be involved. Flash forward to Keith's time and talking to Bill McRaven, who was then the head of JSOC, describing to me how NSA was providing direct support to missions on the ground going to make raids in the evening. So the acceptance of the services to get direct support from the system went through a revolution in those years. Mm -hmm. Admiral Rogers, I'd like to see if you could bring us up to the current day. Um, and, and my question would be, um, we're an open society. When the solar winds hack happens, it, it gets talked about. Uh, the Microsoft Exchange hack, we, we hear all about it. But it also creates an impression uh, the US is, is not doing so well. It's getting hacked, but what is it doing on the other side? 
closed societies like Russia and China are not talking. If there's something ha like that happens to them, they're not talking about it. Can you give us some perspective about how you think the U.S. is doing? Is it doing well and we don't hear about it? Is it suffering a lot of major breaches um, and, and has a lot of work to do? Give us some perspective since the information seems to be a little asymmetric. Well, I would say, look, I think we have to be honest and acknowledge we are not where we want to be and we're not where we need to be. You know, I'm not interested in the blame game. That never really interested me much. We're clearly not where we need to be. We're not where we want to be. You've seen uh, Paul Nakasone, who's the current director. You've seen him, as a matter of fact, highlight the fact, look, one of the challenges is our structures, for example, were predicated on much of our capability was oriented as foreign intelligence organizations. Hey, you're watching adversaries, the Russians in this case, take advantage of that, change the way they operate, you know, use domestic U.S. infrastructure in their operations. Much of the government's capability is just not optimized for that. And there's some historic precedents and reasons why that is not the case. You know, but I just think part of the challenge that we're going to face is doing more of the same and expecting different results probably has not got a high probability of success. You know, my view is we need to pivot a little bit here and think about how we can structure differently. NSA clearly is going to play a huge role in that. It's not by coincidence, for example, that the three arguably senior members in the Biden team focused on cyber are or will be NSA, you know, alumni, or in the case of Ann Newberg in the White House, a current NSA employee. But Jen Easterly, as if she's confirmed as the director of CISA. Chris Inglis, uh, if he is confirmed as the national cyber director, you know, it's a great testament to the National Security Agency and its cybersecurity element, because a lot of times the organization historically is viewed as a SIGINT or the offensive, you know, or exploitation side. But as Mike McConnell and others have, have reminded us, look, we've always had this dual mission for decades. And we're in a position now where, look, it can't be one or the other. We have got to excel in both. And I also thought it was always great about how one each fed the other. A lesson to learn, Greg, again, I apologize for jumping in, but in looking at the contrast uh, between uh, when 9-11 occurred, we, the FISA court had authorized us to intercept in the U.S., foreign communications, official from embassies, from trade organizations, but not of individuals, non-state actors, and not of rotating cell phones. And so that was one of the great gaps that Mike had to try to cover uh, after that occurred. Our adversaries are very conscious of the laws and constraints that we operate under. And for solar winds, it was very clear that the Russians recognized NSA couldn't collect against servers inside the US. So a void there that nobody was covering that they exploited to their own great advantage. Yeah, thank you. General Minahan, would you like to pick up on that? Because this seems to be where the discussion has been going, this, this so-called blind spot or cyber gap where the NSA collects all sorts of signal intelligence overseas, but then when it comes into the US, um, you, you can't see it. You can share that with the FBI or somebody else, uh, but this, can, this process could take a matter of days and, and a good hacker can come and go in that period. Um, so this is, seems like what the Russians did with solar winds was, was come inside, make it look like the operation is taking place inside the US. So, how does the U.S. address that issue and protect civil liberties and not become a, a domestic surveillance organization? Uh, it seems like a pretty nutty question. I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts and, and the, the rest of you as well. Well, uh, first of all, Greg, I appreciate you making room for the Air Force guy here. Thank you. My Navy pals and Army pals um, went through the Dickens to get the kind of support that they needed to the operator. And on my watch, it became clear to me at least that the, that the challenges you're talking about were more about the, the originating chartology of the community than about the technology. And what I mean by that is, if you look back, the Reagan administration was the last one who looked at the charters of the intelligence community 
and then and then apportion them in such a way that we could effectively operate. I don't think that arrangement right now is 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 adequate to meet the challenges as we go forward. So I, where I would head is I would have a commission. Uh, look carefully at the strategic level of the technology, and I probably would come out with a completely redesigned intelligence uh, entity built on far fewer organizations, but on much broader technology than what we have today. And I think that's, you know, if someone is is, um, is uh, tough enough strategically, that would serve the nation for a, the same amount of time that the Reagan era has served us to this point. Mm -hmm. General Alexander, you talk a lot about collective security. Um, what, what does that mean? How does the NSA work with uh, domestic organizations, the private sector, without having to rewrite the Fourth Amendment or do things that are, that are just not going to happen legally, but could perhaps cooperation that could be done voluntarily? So I would put a few facts on the table. If you look at both those attacks, 18,000 companies impacted by the solar winds, over 30,000 by the hafnium attacks, that's 48,000 companies that didn't know they were hacked. So the first thing I put on the table is what we're doing in cyber is insufficient to even the companies that are defending themselves. So we have to have a cultural shift. What do we do to protect companies in cyberspace? That's part one. And I think that's got to go beyond the current capability to detect what we know, to actually hunt for what we don't know and share that. The second part is we should share that across companies and sectors and a collective strategy. I think that's key. I think about 90 banks out there with 10 people each. The amount of information they're getting is doubling every year. Barron's has a great article out on it today. If you look at that, <clears throat> what it says, those 10 people are gonna have twice as much work next year and they can't hire 10 more people. But imagine how if those 90 banks took their 10 people each and worked them together collectively. That's 900 people protecting that, that sector together. And if they shared that information anonymously without personally identifiable information, without the content of communications, they could share it at the same time with the government. Build a radar picture for this nation that allows you to see what's going on in cyberspace without regard to personally identifiable information or the content communications so that NSA and Cyber Command can do what they need to do. We need to do that shift. I believe, you know, what, what we've seen trans, uh, transpire from the time Admiral Inman was there till uh, Admiral Rogers, that's a lot of Navy, uh, in between <laughs> the two Cs, is a huge change in this technology. Our wealth, our future is in this network. That's the economy of this country and it's at risk. Look at what happened this weekend in Iran. Iran attacked Saudi Aramco and our nation in 2012 with distributed denial of service attacks for the reason of sanctions in the energy and finance. Now look what's going on today. I think this is a huge risk to our country and I think we have to get out in front of it. Admiral Lehman, go ahead. Uh, Greg, I want to I want to jump in if I could just add a a, a perspective. Um, uh, first of all, the the executive order twelve triple three signed by President Reagan. We did get President Bush to update that. It took us a year. It was a big bureaucratic fight, but we did uh, update it consistent with the law uh, that resulted in the IRTPA, the uh, Intelligence Re Reform Terrorist Prevention Act. So we did we did do that. The the FISA legislation was for good purpose, FISA, Foreign, in, uh, in, um, Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Act. Set up the court, yeah, it was a Surveillance Act. Uh, th there were transgressions, serious transgressions, Nixon and before, by a series of operations, intelligence and law enforcement. So the Congress in, with FISA in 78 said, intelligence, it's a foreign market only, a foreign uh, target audience only, non-domestic. So that's, that's the law of the land. Now we had to change FISA, update it because of terrorism, the program that General Alexander mentioned. That took another two years, but we finally, we had the president's support. We worked with the Congress. We finally got that modified so that NSA could intercept communications from a terrorist overseas, communicating with another, another terrorist overseas, but the transmission path was through the United States. 
we were no longer required to get a warrant. It previously, if it passed through the U.S., it's on a wire. You have to have a warrant. So that was one of the, one of the changes. I believe the future for how we address this problem, and it, in my view, it is a strategic critical problem. Uh, General Alexander mentioned the nation's wealth is now digital. We are digitally dependent. It, it lies within the law. Having a conversation later this week with Judge uh, Chertoff, former uh, Secretary of, of Homeland Security, who also is one of the authors of the Patriot Act. And so where we've got this conversation so far is NSA's authorities today are captured in law. The guiding document for what NSA does with regard to information protection or make code is NSD 42, signed by George H.W. Bush, the 5th of July, 1990. It's got to be changed because it restricts NSA to only looking at national security systems. I would also take the next step to say that the, the capabilities of NSA are unmatched. They cannot be replicated. And if you frame it properly in law, we could have NSA's make code organization supported by the break code organization looking inside US domestic infrastructure for malware. And so in, in my view, what General Alexander describes is a way to get there from the commercial collaborative cooperative aspect, but to properly harness authorities, you need to capture it in law. So in my view, that's the next step. Okay. It'd be a hard hey, argument. Would anybody hey, like to pick? Me? Yeah, Admiral Rogers, if you could pick yeah, up on that a little bit. Yeah. I think both Admiral McConnell and General Alexander you know, they're talking about two important aspects of the problem. My biggest frustration as the last guy was, I look at how much capacity the private sector has. I look at how much capacity NSA had and Cyber Command increasingly. I looked at what we were doing with DHS and CISA. I looked at what we were doing with the FBI and I thought, we are building magnificent cylinders of excellence. Why are we not creating integrated teams? I don't understand why we are not working together 24 seven real time on this problem because expecting each of us to independently do our thing, I thought that was so suboptimal. And you saw that play out in solar winds. It wasn't anybody in the government who identified the activity. It was the but is, is, is there a way to do this in terms of just greater cooperation between with the NSA and the FBI and CISA and private companies? Or do you need uh, laws to be changed, a new organization to be set up um, is this, you know, is this? I think you're going to find it's a combination of all of that. There is no one single solution to this problem. There's no one single so, law, so structure. There's no one single entity. But we do need to look at changing the legal framework. And quite frankly, I think we need to take a look at the way we're organized and the way we're actually executing. I, I would make the point we did not have cooperation in the Department of Defense for years. Services went their own way until Goldwater Nichols of 19. Uh, 86, that forced uh, collaboration. And when, the, when they were debating the bill, every service chief and service secretary and the Secretary of Defense testified against it. But Go Order Nichols got it through anyway, and President Reagan signed it. The first dust up was Desert Shield Storm. I got to be the fly on the wall going back up after the war. We accomplished what we were after. And I heard the service chief say, Go Order Nichols, the greatest thing that ever happened to us. So you're going to have bureaucratic resistance unless there's a forcing function. In my view, the forcing function is the law. Mm -hmm. So Greg, uh, when we went to have the commercial off-the-shelf technology, the communications and IT that we have today sort of supplant the government off-the-shelf, the private side was now providing the bulk of the IT that was being used. And we went from the industrial age to the information age. And so that spans all of these directors. We uh, did a major study, the government did a major study uh, as Obama was coming in uh, a long time ago. And we've been admiring this uh, problem uh, of cybersecurity and uh, cyber resilience all that time. Now with this new movement by the Biden administration to have a, an advisor actually uh, in, in it now standing up for what has been a, nothing but a small 10 or 12 person White House office trying to advance the ball in cybersecurity uh, for the last 15 years. 
And with Inglis coming in as an excellent cyber director and his trade rep style staff, he can now put together teams. And with uh, CISA and DHS uh, finally perhaps getting aligned, better aligned with NSA, uh, there's a real opportunity here to move forward. Uh, the first thing that has to be addressed in my view is this public-private piece. Lots of opportunities, lots of work uh, to be done. I think we need to have both incentives and rewards uh, and also penalties and standards and regulations. And uh, so Chris Inglis, as the National Cyber Director, is going to have to operate on a broad technology front, on a broad front that deals with strategy, leadership, governance, organized for success, uh, all the kinds of things that are really the public policy part, not the technology part. And I believe if we don't move forward in the public policy side uh, and make good on our opportunities here, uh, we're going to be coming from behind for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I know we have a lot of uh, cyber experts listening in, but just for the sort of lay people in our audience, Chris Inglis was uh, the deputy at NSA, and he's just been appointed this week as the national cyber director at the White House. For That position was just created uh, in December. Um, Ann Neuberger is on the National Security Council, another senior NSA person. Uh, current NSA person who's at the National Security Council, and Jen Easterly, uh, another uh, NSA person, uh, is now in charge of CISA, which deals with domestic issues. So it does seem like the Biden administration does seem to be putting a lot of emphasis. Um, uh, I'll throw this out there to anybody. Um, is there what is the next step that you'd like to see the Greg, administration there's a, take? Greg, there's a, there's a fourth personality that we haven't mentioned, uh, who also is a former NSA person nominated to be the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, Mr. Ron Moultrie. So that's going to add another voice in that really understands this problem. The, the point, uh, before we move on, the point I would emphasize to the listeners, this is a critical strategic problem. The wealth of the nation is digital. We are digitally dependent. If we don't figure out how to protect this, it's going to, it's going to hurt the nation long term. The Chinese on a regular basis are taking information out of the U.S. Um, uh, industrial base or the, the technology base and making the same products cheaper and beating us in the market. That's the, that's the fundamental issue we've got to recognize and deal with. Mm -hmm. Jeff, on the technology, Greg, on the technology side, there are models already out there to follow. Uh, MCC in 83, Semitech in 87, where you bring together the, both the government and the private sector to advance research technology that's applicable to solving these problems, particularly focused on what you do for industry. I've been hawking this for about three years now. Senator Cornyn is interested in it, but I haven't found many others who were. But we need to get moving on it. It lets NSA and DHL, uh, Department of Homeland Security, be members and flow their knowledge in while protecting sources and methods and let the private sector bring the lead on what emerging technologies are there to make sure that we're making available all across private and public sectors, staying ahead of the Chinese and the Russians. General Menahan, I'd, I'd like to uh, bring you in on a question that's near and dear to my heart, and that is, why can't the NSA share a little more with the media and the public? Obviously, there are serious issues of classification, but a lot of these issues are no longer spy versus spy. If the Russians are meddling in a U.S. election, the public needs to know about that. If Solar Winds is, is hacked and the Microsoft Exchange, that's tens of thousands of companies that need to know what's going on. If the Chinese are stealing research at American universities, the, the, the public and these companies and these institutions need to be informed. And yet the, the NSA, the, sort of out of its historical uh, mode of secrecy is still very, very reluctant uh, to, to even engage, even if it's on background or off the record or, or in a general sense. Do you think they should do more? And if so, how would they, should they go about that? Well, the answer in my view, Bruce, they, they should do more, but I don't like the premise that you're suggesting that that's driven because they're not doing enough now. Given you know, what you've listened to for the last 20 or 30 minutes, 
is a strategic discussion about how this business should be done in the future. And we're not doing it right. And so that's where the that's where the implementation. So I'll, let's play this back. Should we give you a security clearance? <laughs> huh? You want that? Well, uh, uh, then I couldn't then I couldn't talk about it. <laughs> I know, I know. So that's the, there. There's the dilemma right there, right? We've got to be sports minded about it. We're playing football, and we should play soccer. And so you know, having having that, we have the technology. You have the customer base the, to, to make Mike McConnell's point even stronger. The, the major vulnerabilities of the strategic apparatus of the country are not in the Department of Defense. And so how do, we, how do we recognize that and then create an information flow that supports an understanding that, that we all agree that at some point it is an American problem and America needs to be taken care of as part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also um, think, Greg, I, I think you've also seen, you can see the change. Look at what NSA has been doing in terms of public cyber security information sharing over the last, you know, several years, a, a distinct evolution. You look at, you know, during my time, I thought what we did in response to the Russian attempts to influence the 2016 presidential election, I mean, we went very public, very direct. You know, the DNI, the director of the CIA, myself, we, we put out both classified and unclassified versions of everything. We did a ton of public interaction trying to highlight to the nation, hey, look, we're watching something here that should be concern of all of us. So I don't want to make it sound like, hey, NSA is not an organization that communicates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that uh, transparency, openness, and sharing is a a constant big problem for the intelligence community in general. And we need help and cover in being able to do our jobs. I, I do think you would want the intelligence community to be able to do its job professionally and successfully and deeply penetrate threat adversaries as a first priority. And the rest of this uh, you know, has to follow over time because we're in the job of secrets. Of course, I'm old school. I think secrets should come first. And I, I do believe that for the future, given all the things that are gonna be happening in technology, and especially with uh, the things that are coming, um, uh, both the opportunities and the challenges built around uh, uh, artificial intelligence and quantum and, and use of encryption and all the other things that are happening and the general large cyber world that existing out there, uh, organizations like NSA are going to continue to be challenged to be able to successfully do their vision for the future. So this is a tough balancing act for us. I'm not saying don't do it. I just say that it's hard and uh, we need as much help. I do think that there's a willingness to share, but I do think that there's also some responsibilities on the part of the people that we share with to also put themselves in a position where they can receive and protect those secrets. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Could, could, I add, could I add some uh, in on this? Because I think one of the things that our country has to step up and realize is that cyber is, covers both the public and private sector. It's our nation. It's the future of this country. <clears throat> and yet we're approaching it as if only these guys are in charge or doing something. The reality is we have to learn to work together, to fight together in cyberspace to actually defend this nation. And we've got to practice that. We need the tools to see it, the tools to share back and forth between government and the private sector and how we're actually going to fight. Look at what's going on around the world, Russia, China, Iran. We can add in North Korea, but those three right now are as bad as it's been for a while. And you see China, a resurgent China and what's going on. They're stealing us blind. We're losing our future. We have to get out in front of this. And I think it has to be something that's not Let's notify people on breaches. Well, that's after the fact. That's like saying we got 18,000 companies who would be sending in a breach notification. That's not helping you. Solve the problem by working together. Figure this out. And, you know, the, the honor and privilege of serving at NSA, they're the best people in this area. They are truly the best. We need to leverage them on how to solve this problem and get out in front of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's part of our future. We can't just sit by and say, let's, let's do another, you know, Fed ramp and let's do another NIST controls and let's do this. The, the real issue is the adversaries are fighting us in this space. They're stealing us blind 
and we're coming up with processes to slow them down, but we're not defending our nation. I think we've got to change that paradigm, change the culture of the victim being the one who's wrong to, to getting out in front. In, in the time we have left here, gentlemen, uh, I'd like to turn to some of the questions we've had from our attendees. They, they've sent us some really good questions. So I'd like to turn to that. I'll throw this out there for anybody who wants to jump in. We often hear about a, a cyber Pearl Harbor. Um, well, you know, what does that term mean to you or what kind of cyber nightmares do you have? I, I'm looking for something that's, that's realistic that you really think is a, is a vulnerability um, that, that could be very, very damaging. What, what, anybody want to jump in on that Pick one? Up. I, I probably was one of the first to use that term. Uh, remember, I started to focus on this early 90s. Uh, mm -hmm. I visited anybody who would listen, the, the House, the Senate, the White House, the Secretary of Defense. I, I couldn't get anybody to pay any attention to what I, the points that I was trying to make. The points that were very eloquently just made by General Alexander we generally had an understanding of that way back and we're trying to make the case. We have to get ready. We have to adapt. We have to change. And uh, uh, I couldn't get anyone to pay any attention. So I use cyber Pearl Harbor. It has been used by many people since the, the most senior person I've seen use it with some emphasis was uh, 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 secretary of defense Panetta. And he's used it again, just recently. Uh, I would, I would say you could make a case that the most recent exploits by the Russians and the Chinese are a cyber Pearl Harbor. And here's why. There was a little debate about, is this espionage or is it sabotage? And then we had all kinds of reactions. Uh, it's clearly espionage. It's clearly espionage. But the difference between espionage and sabotage is intent. If you have access to take and extract information at will, you have remote control. If you have remote control, you can contaminate or shut down or destroy that computer just as easily. So I think we've had it already, but we don't recognize it the way we think of Pearl Harbor with bomb sinking ships. I think so when Henry Bottle first used the term cyber Pearl Harbor, I think he said that he didn't think the country would get with fixing the problem until the Pearl Harbor came. And actually to a degree, that's pretty been true, I think um, up until now. Uh, we needed some kind of galvanizing event to uh, get with it. But basically, our country is uh, extremely vulnerable until we start working the fixes. And I'm hoping that we don't have the Pearl Harbor until we've had a chance to get uh, going with uh, the current effort we have to tighten up information security and resilience. Just think I, about I, I the understand. vulnerability. Go ahead, Bob. Just think about the vulnerability of the electric grid the vulnerability of the air control system and how that would impact all of us across the country with an attack on either one. Yeah, finance, I mean, it, it, literally, there, I, I think the DHS identifi identifies 16 or 17 critical infrastructures. At least 14 17. or 15 of them are digitally dependent. They are run by digital uh, infrastructure and, th and that can be degraded or, or contaminated or destroyed. Yeah, Admiral Rogers, could you pick up on that? And as a cyber Pearl Harbor, to use that term, is it something uh, that will be big and visible, like taking down the electrical grid or the, the air, air transport system of the, the, the airlines? Uh, or is it something we won't even see, like a solar winds where the hackers are going through US government systems and, and other private company systems quietly, and we don't even know that it's happening? Yeah. It, it'll probably be a combination of both. L let me go back to the previous question. I understand why Mike and my predecessors went down this, went down this road with this analogy, but I'll be honest with you, I hated it. Why? Guys, Pearl Harbor was a single strategic event. We're dealing with a sustained campaign that is executed over years by these adversaries. We have got to think about this as a sustained fight. And I understand why Mike and others were trying to highlight to everybody, hey, look, there's something potentially cataclysmic almost here, an event with strategic implications. I just thought, while that's true, we've got to think about this as a sustained campaign on the part of adversaries against us. And that means our strategy has to reflect that we're fighting a sustained adversary. This isn't gonna be a one-time event, everything will go bad and then we'll, we're gonna focus all our attention and everything's gonna be perfect. I, I just didn't think that was the way it was gonna work out. 
I, I use the, way beyond uh, the modern on net activity. Modern microelectronics is basically vulnerable to lots of different kinds of threats. And that, and clearly our adversaries uh, know that. So there are pervasively very large scale problems to be solved here across a very broad front using the public private side and we need to get on with it quickly. If I could just add the um, rationale for using the term, bureaucracies resist change. If, if you try to get a bureaucracy to change, normally it will choose failure over change. That's just the, the, the history of bureaucracy. So I use Cyber Pearl Harbor for a reason. The US public and the Congress was against being in World War I. The US and the Congress was against being in World War II. Two events propelled us in. The Zimmerman telegram and the sinking of Lusitania for World War I, we're in. Pearl Harbor, as soon as that happened, we're in. So I was trying to make the case of something significant that would cause the bureaucratic functions added to the Congress, the White House, to think of this in the way that I try to, what I, how I try to describe the threat we are facing. The, the Chinese left uh, to their own devices want to be the center of the world with their rules, not the rules the U.S. created with its allies after World War II. They want to change the world, and they say that publicly. And so if we don't figure out a way to keep them from taking the technology that, that adds to that, that set of goals, then we're going to find ourselves not being the prominent player we've been in the past. General Alexander, I'd like to toss this one to you. Um, there's there's this whole seafront of, of threats, but the, but the Russian government and the Chinese government uh, sort of stand out as the two most serious. Could you talk about what they do well and how they might be different and, and how defenses might have to be set up to guard against both of them? So uh, it's interesting you use seafront with four admirals on here. I think uh, I noticed that uh, General Minahan perked up to that. I think the difference that I see, um, and in part uh, both different and the same, they both use this as an element of national power. And when you look at what China is doing, it's really their major impact in cyberspace is to steal intellectual property, as Admiral McConnell said. They're stealing us blind. Some of the numbers go in excess of $500 billion a year in intellectual property. When you think about that, that's our future. That's the future of our, of our country. What concerns me about China though, is not the theft. It's what they can do with the access that they get. And I think, again, I would uh, uh, just say the same thing Admiral McConnell said. They're in networks. They have stated publicly that they would take on a technologically sophisticated threat using cyber first. So they've already put that on the table. They said, we will attack our adversaries in cyber first. We're not ready for that. You know, it's like there's two different pools. There's the public sector and then there's the government. And the public sector cannot fight back against this. We've got to fix that. Russia is slightly different. I think Russia's issue, as I see it, is what do they do about Eastern Europe? Where does Russia stand? Russia has a bunch of problems internal with its wealth, with everything that's going on. And then there's Eastern Ukraine and the SVR. I think what the SVR was doing was trying to figure out what's going to happen to the, the six guys that were indicted from the 2017 election. And if you go back, that, that probably is correct. But they also use it for criminal activity. They allow their teams to moonlight. So these guys can use their infrastructure to moonlight at night and steal money, ransomware and other things. So you see that generally coming from the Russian side. And I think that's a huge set of issues for our nation. So I see it in both those. And you know, I, I would add Iran in, Greg, because Iran right now is the looming threat with what happened Saturday or Sunday um, on the Tons. The last time something like that happened, Saudi Aramco and then 350 distributed denial of service attacks on our country. What happens if they use a wiper virus? It's a whole, it's a, that's your Pearl Harbor. That changes the game uh, you know, in a huge way. And we're not ready for that because we, the government, could not see that attack in time to do something about it. So that's the issue. What you're, what you're depending on NSA and Cyber Command is to see everything else in the world without having the benefit of what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make, build that link. Go ahead. 
Yeah, General Minahan, let me pick up on that. We talk about the Iranian nuclear program, the North Korean nuclear program, um, military, traditional military threats or nuclear military threats. We still talk a lot less about uh, cybersecurity. And one of our uh, viewers is, is asking, is cybersecurity the most significant threat to the U.S. today, or at least a very underrated one? Well, uh, Greg, I'd, I'd make a couple of three points. One, the fight is already on. We've been attacked and we did not respond. So the Chinese lesson learned is we're not going to fight. If you want to change that, you're going to have to fight back along the lines that all the directors have mentioned. Two, um, it might turn out that the Pearl Harbor is not us, but our victims. Suppose one of us was conducting an intelligence operation and crashed their system. They get to decide if that was an attack or not. You don't get, you know, I might say, well, hey, that's just me. I'm just an Intel puke trying to collect money and trying to collect uh, Intel. And they may say, no, no, you attacked me. You, you, you destroyed my network or brought it down or whatever. So the notion here of a Pearl Harbor is not restricted to us. And could actually, you could actually get there quicker along the lines that I just mentioned than the more, the more traditional Pearl Harbor uh, piece. Mm -hmm. The third part is that if you're gonna, if, if you're going to succeed, the distinguishing characteristic for the Americans is the ability to work together com commercially and in the federal public. So what we have to do is take advantage of what we do best after the Pearl Harbor, which is come together and fight the fight. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of you, uh, since leaving your government service, uh, are working in cybersecurity in, in the private sector. Um, how does it look different from, uh, from that side of the fence? Um, and uh, what, what, uh, what do you think more could be done? Are, are some private companies still reluctant to share or announce if they've had a cyber attack? Give us the give us the since you, many of you had the perspective on both sides, the government side and the private side. Uh, how does it how does it look differently? I would sum it up by saying it looks frustrating. Now that's not to say they're not great companies doing great things, and we're going to have to depend on those companies at some point. But from from where I sit, uh, the issue is a is a policy question, and does the White House, uh, do the members of the Congress, do they understand this? Are they willing to take the steps that would cause us to have collective security or integrated response? Uh, several of the speakers have talked about uh, incentives or rules or guidance to cause us to work together. We're going to have to do that ultimately. And one thing I'd just highlight, uh, General Alexander, I heard it, I thought I heard him say 500 million going to China each year. That, that I think he meant to say 500 billion. Hey, Greg, the only you know, thing- from my, from my point of view, I would, I'm sorry, like uh, looking through, going to industry and then looking back at the government, particularly the government acquisition system, very ponderous, uh, was a kind of a revelation having arrived in industry. Um, I spent a lot of time as the director of NSA trying to uh, streamline and reform NSA's internal industry practices as it related to acquisition, whether it was big bang acquisition for hundreds of millions of dollars worth of programs or smaller acquisitions or doing what General Alexander finally had to do, which is do hybrid kinds of uh, acquisitions. And so acquisition reform still is a requirement for the DOD. Um, NSA is a part of the Department of Defense or the Intel community. And uh, I think that's still a big issue because we need to have very flexible uh, acquisition rules. The Intel community already has special authorities for acquisition, but they're not enough. And that's the way we're going to work successfully with speed with industry for the future. Admiral Rogers, you wanted to pick up on that? Yeah, the only thing I was going to add it, in my experience in the private sector now, both in the U.S. and overseas, is it's very uneven. And the biggest frustration to me always was you want the pain of the one to lead to the benefit of the many. And yet, private entities, they're not any more incentivized to be open about activities, quite frankly, than in many ways the government is. You keep, you know, the same exploits, the same vulnerabilities being used over and over and over again. 
you know, we have got to get to this idea, as everybody has said, of a much more collective, integrated approach to how we're going to do this. Expecting all these individual entities to do this all on their own. Likewise, it was in the government. I, I always used to, well, I remember in the White House going, so how many resources do you think the Department of Agriculture has to defend itself cyberwise versus the DOD? But you're theoretically expecting them to just do it all by themselves. I'm going, look, this is not a sustainable model, you guys. We it just there isn't enough talent, there isn't enough resources to have everybody trying to do their own thing. It just doesn't get us where we need to be. General Alexander, you founded a company, IronNet, which just uh, is, is going getting ready to go public. <clears throat> Um, it's involved in cybersecurity. Just tell us a little bit about IronNet and what you're trying to do in the private sector to, to help with the, the nation's uh, cybersecurity. So it was actually based on my um, uh, experience at NSA and Cyber Command, what we couldn't do, we couldn't see the private sector. And part of it was the private sector couldn't help show what they're, what's happening to them. And that issue was uh, everybody bases their, their defense on signatures, what we know, what's already hit us. And what they actually need to share is sharing what you know, well, you already know that. There's nothing left to share. You know it. Um, here's the threat. Here's how I block it. I share that. Everybody's got that. What they need to share is what they don't know, the unknown. And to do that, you have to shift to behavioral analytics. It's really hard. It, it, nobody was successful in the time I was there in getting that going. We couldn't get it going. Nobody would do it. Everybody said it's too hard. So that's what we started out on. And what we found out is if you can make that work, and we, we got some great people from University of Chicago and out of DARPA and others to help us build models, and it's taken seven years. But those give you the ability to see things that are unknown and share those at speed across companies within sectors and potentially with the government. It's to build the radar picture of what we need to. So when, when I left there, you know, my thought was, I love the time at NSA. I would have stayed forever. Uh, what they said, one of the, my Navy execs said, you know, you're gonna be the Admiral Rickover for cyber. And I thought, <laughs> whoa, he was 34 years there. I need to get out quick. Uh, so that took eight years and eight months, but. But you know, the mission, I think we can, we all can still help. You know, it's our country and most of it's in the private sector side. We need to help the private sector do what they can to share that information with the government and vice versa. So build that real-time radar picture um, that, that allowed Admiral Min or General Minahan and Chris to fly easily across the country. And let's do that for cyber and do it at network speed. I think technically we can do it. You know, and, go ahead. Admiral McConnell, you're working on a very interesting project with Cyber Florida, where you're working with schools in that state to try to, to help them identify uh, disinformation, misinformation. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing and, and how you want to expand that and, and teach young people how to, to be uh, good cyber uh, citizens? Greg, I took on this job about a year ago, a little more than a year ago. Uh, the state legislature in Florida had passed a bill in 2014 to create an organization in the academic environment to focus on three things, uh, education, uh, cybersecurity education, cybersecurity research, and then outreach to the public and businesses and local governments and so on. So that was the mission. So when, when I took the job, I really started to think about if we're going to change the culture, the behavior, and so on, where do you start? And so now there are a number of initiatives. Uh, as a nation, we're half a million short in these skills. In Florida, we're, uh, we're, we've gone from 25,000 to 30,000. Number keeps going up. So we've got a big uh, number to fill in terms of graduates of computer science and uh, electrical engineering and so on. So that's one facet of it. And then we're trying to do some research with, with uh, attracting federal dollars, private dollars, whatever. But where the sweet spots seem to me is digital literacy. I, I guess I've been around this for so long and I've talked to so many senators and I'd say the word computer and oh, oh no, we don't, we don't, you know, you have to talk to my grandchildren. I don't, I, you know, I got a yellow tablet. So that's always stuck with me. So I said, you know, why don't we start in grade school? Uh, we teach read and write and arithmetic. I remember my grade school days is, you know, learn the alphabet, learn how to spell. So well, why don't we teach something about digital infrastructure, digital literacy, what we're calling it is cyber citizenship. And for the listeners who may not have known this, the best article we've had on it was done by you and an NPR. <laughs> uh, we got great feedback on that, Greg. We really appreciate it. 
But just think of it this way. How does a citizen today sort out the wheat from the chaff, the information, the real information from the misinformation? How do you understand that? How do you have a set of basic skills? And I would say uh, we all grew up as youngsters learning to read and write. We want to drive a car. We understand the rules of the road. It's just uh, it's everybody understands it. Why don't we do that for our kids today? So in addition to whatever they do in their profession, they understand the basics of digital literacy and how to navigate that space. Some of them will go on to be um, majors in electrical engineering or computer science, computer engineering. That's part, that's where we started. But and we're going to increase that flow of youngsters going into these more technical courses. But in the in the discovery was just basic understanding by the kids. And so we've gotten great support from not only the, the children, but their parents, and it's growing. We started small in Tampa. Now we're reached across to Miami. Uh, we're reaching up to Jacksonville and Tallahassee. So we'll be statewide. What we wanna do, and thanks to NSA, they created a the, end of the Centers for Academic Excellence program. Some money was added to the budget to create some, some grants. And uh, one of them is workforce development, take current people, vets and first responders and train them from what they were doing to be cyber ninjas. Uh, and so the, the other part of it is K through 12 focus. So we're excited about this and uh, it's, it's working. It's a place to start. Uh, I won't be around to see the end result, but at least uh, hopefully my grandchildren will and will get the nation in a better place in terms of its digital literacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a, it's a fascinating thing to study. Gentlemen, we're almost out of time. So I want my final question for all of you, 30 seconds, um, 10 years from now, what should the NSA uh, be focused on? And we'll go, we'll go in order of your directorship. Uh, Admiral Inman, uh, you go first. Uh, Greg, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm <laughs> going to do what I was trying to have my hand up for. And that's a tribute to those who are not with us who led this organization. We know we have just Keith and Ken here, four Navy who've been fortunate to have longevity. But Lou Allen, my predecessor, uh, Air Force, Chief Staff of the Air Force. Uh, Link Farr, my successor, Air Force. Uh, General Odom, Army, who succeeded him. And our absent colleague uh, today, Mike, who had a stroke, he's recovering from it. So the agency has benefited from broad leadership all across the services. And simply four of us who are here today are fortunate for longevity. Well, thank you. That was better than the question I had anyway. But uh, uh, Admiral Studeman, what, what, what do you think the, the NSA should look like a decade from now? Nope, you're muted. Sorry, they have to continue to be the force behind uh, the effort on the part of the nation to correct itself, supporting the NSA people that are there. Uh, NSA continues with these two missions, but everything is continuing to grow, including even the requirement uh, under the DNI to support domestic collection. So we have to get out in front, it seems to me, on the research side, but we also have to be out in front on the governance and uh, strategy side. Uh, all these new technologies that are coming are going to be a challenge for any perfect NSA with the best people in the world. So we have to continue to hire the best people in the world. But also the one thing that's been said all along is we need to make that bridged connection between the public and the private side so that we can partner together both on the offensive and the defensive side. Mm -hmm. Admiral, Admiral McConnell? One quick note for uh, Emma Rogers, the uh, reason uh, President Obama thought 85% of his intel came from NSA is because that's what I told him when we were doing the presidential <laughs> daily briefings and the prep before he won the election. So this is a side note. The question you ask is uh, how important 10 years from now or what role? More important than ever, we are becoming more and more uh, digitally dependent. The, the, the context of today's ebb and flow has been um, acquisition reform and legal reform, and all that sort of thing. I'd refer you to an article. Uh, it's in the congressional record. Michelle Floyd and I did it in January 2020. January 2020, Michelle Floyd and I. She talks about the digital changes and the need to modify acquisition reform in DOD. It's, it's a very insightful article. But what that sets up for me 
is as we go forward with more of this network connectivity around the world, it shrinks the world. And then in NSA's mission, make uh, exploiting for potential adversaries and protecting for the country are become more important, not less. Mm -hmm. General Minahan. Yep, you're, yeah, okay. I'm here, I'm here. Um, I'll say it a little differently. If you look historically, um, Chris Inglis is an InfoSec guy. Um, and he represents, in my view, the model of information assurance, which is both sides. And Chris will bring that leadership um, in at the top. So I'll bet in 10 years, 50% uh, the people who work at the National Security Agency will be in industry. Okay, General Alexander. Yeah, I, I think um, we're gonna see this network grow and our dependence on it grow. And with it, we've got to make sure we secure it. I think NSA and Cyber Command will lead that for our country. And I think having these two together to do that is absolutely the right thing. And it expands really the CSS part of that mission into now something that can help defend our nation. I believe in this next decade, we will be challenged. We need to be ready. I think we have the force on the government side. We just don't have the visibility we need. Mm -hmm. Admiral Rogers, you get the last word. So I got that going for me. Hey, look, as you've heard, there is no doubt NSA's mission is optimized for the world of today and tomorrow. It has never been more relevant and its relevancy will only increase. That means the pressures will also grow and the expectations and the need of the organization will grow. So that'll bring its own set of challenges. And the positive to me is I think 10 years from now, it'll be every bit as motivated with men and women who really bring real value and the ability to execute the mission and generate these critical outcomes for our nation and our friends and allies. The, the biggest thing I would say for 10 years from now, you have to be open to the idea that in executing these missions, we have to be open to different constructs and different approaches. And we're going to be one part of a broader team. And our job is to help that broader team succeed. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank all you gentlemen for a fascinating discussion today. Uh, it's been absolutely my pleasure. Thank you all so much. And I will throw it back to Laura Nelson. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Greg. Well, and much, Greg. <laughs> much appreciated. Thank you to the directors who graciously given their time to join us today. We hope that in the not too distant future, we may all come together for a piece of cake to celebrate our foundation's anniversary. Also a note of appreciation to our sponsors, Dell Technologies, Fed Data, Paraton, Mantech, Accenture, and AT&T. As a reminder, the National Cryptologic Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Your contributions help us to continue to provide programming like this. We thank you all for attending today. <laughs>